Chapter 65, Mission 1, D-Rank. The new Genin teams don't actually receive new missions right away. The first day or two are reserved for team building and exercises, as the Jonin sensei need to ensure their students are up to par and working well enough together. For Team 9, however, that wasn't entirely necessary. Naruto spent the better part of a year training them together during their travels and kept doing so while they attended the academy. Every bit of training they've undergone has been with teamwork in mind that they'd be on the same team when they become ninja. Therefore, the day of graduation was spent mostly in celebration and eating at Ramanichiraku. At the end, though, they still had a sparring session, their first as an official team. And today. Today, they take on their first mission. To prepare for the big moment, Katori is practicing in front of the full-body living room mirror. She places one hand on her hip and raises her fist high up. Dissatisfied, she returns to a neutral posture before thinking something over again. She then playfully sticks out her tongue and makes a V sign. No, that's not it, either. What are you doing? Hinata asks as she walks into the room, carrying Hiroto in her arms for his breakfast. Hey, mom. I'm practicing my victory pose. Katori says as she raises both arms high up this time but isn't happy with that one, either. Your victory pose? Hinata raises a brow. Yep. She twirls around and grins. The pose I'm gonna make when we finish our first big mission together. Carrying two backpacks, Naruto also hops down into the room from the second floor, skipping several steps as he does. What's this about victory? Dad, you had a victory pose, right? Katori asks. I didn't, I don't think. He answers with some hesitation, trying to recall if he ever had one. He walks over and kisses his wife and son. Oh, come on, you totally had one. She then turns to Hinata. He totally did, right? Like giving a thumbs up and shouting believe it. Or something like that? Hinata shakes her head. Not really, no. And besides, I'd never say something like that. Naruto complains. You know, I'm starting to wonder if you're really my parents. Katori shakes her head in disappointment. Naruto laughs and throws one of the backpacks to Katori who snatches it mid-air. Come on, we're gonna be late. You can practice your pose on the way. Katori runs by Hinata to give her a hug and nibble on Hiroto's nose, the toddler giggling in response. You behave, lil guy. I could say the same to you. Hinata chuckles. Not a chance. Katori laughs and runs out the door with Naruto. See you tonight. Naruto waves. If you come back early and I'm not home, send a clone to the Naras. We're having a playdate. Hinata warns of her plans. Will do. With that, Naruto and Katori rush out the door with the expectation of heading directly for the Hakage Tower, where they're to meet with the rest of Team 9, but that's slightly halted when they meet Karen and little Chihei right in front of their door. Oh hey, Karen, Chihei. Katori waves to them as she swerves around to not smack right into them. Going out already? She asks the rushing duo. Yep. Hey, buddy. Naruto boops Chihei on the nose. Getting our first mission today. So I just missed you, huh? Wanted to talk to you about something before you left. Did you forget who you're talking to? Naruto grins. I can do both. Shadow clone. The original Naruto and Katori continue on their path, while the clone remains with Karen. Yo. The clone salutes. Wacha wanted to talk about? Karen blinks for a second before shaking her head. I don't think I'll ever get used to this. It's about the day-to-day -day tasks around the clan. Since you're going to be increasingly busy with missions, you won't always be available, and it's unrealistic to rely on shadow clones. Ah, about that. I trust you completely to deal with things when I'm not around. He says without hesitation. I'd still need your confirmation, though, as clan head. Karen tries to explain. Well, you have it. If it's something you think is a good idea, you have my confirmation to do it. He says like it's the obvious thing to do. Think of it as practice, you know? For when you become clan head. She rubs her forehead in frustration. Listen, I'm. Then she registers his words. I'm sorry, when I what now? Take over? Were you kicked in the head? Yeah. About the first thing, I mean. You remember my goal is to become Hakage, right? When that happens, I'll have to step down as clan head, and they're gonna need someone reliable to step in. That's you. The Yuzumaki is a shinobi clan, and I'm definitely not a shinobi. She reminds him. That task should go to Akashi, or Kyoto, or even Michi. You don't have to worry about a thing, cousin. Naruto hugs her and gives her a quick peck on the top of the head. You're a perfect fit. Immediately after, the shadow clone dismisses himself. Wait. Naruto, get back here. She shouts into the void, Chihei reaching over to his mom in confusion. Karen holds his small arms in her hand and turns to the door where Hinata is awaiting her guest. 
He's infuriating. She complains. Hinata giggles and beckons her to enter. Come on, you can tell me all about it. Just at the Hakage Tower, Naruto stops in his tracks and turns around to look at the direction of the Uzumaki district when the memories from the clone come back to him. Katori, Yakameru, and Shoto turn to him in anticipation. Dad, something happened? Naruto continues to walk with them, with a light chuckle. Nah, it's nothing. But I'm probably gonna get an earful from Karen when I get back. Are you going to be alright, sensei? Yakameru worries. It's fine, I've survived worse. I think. Naruto dismisses their worries. Come on, let's get our first mission. With that set aside, they make their way up to the mission assignment desk, located in a building adjacent to the Hakage Tower and the Academy. It's a small building, serving a singular purpose as the name would suggest. Typically there's several rooms that missions can be assigned from, but for this special occasion, all newly formed teams are prompted to go to the same room. Within, standing behind the desk surrounded by other shinobi who work here, is the fifth Hakage, Lady Tsunada Senju, who welcomes them all with a smile. Team 9. Welcome. Ah, Gran, I mean, Lady Hakage. Katori waves to her after correcting herself halfway through. Yakamaru and Shoto Bo. So you're giving us our missions, huh? Naruto steps up to the desk. It's customary, after all, for the Hakage to give a new team's first mission. She presses a scroll down in front of her for Team 9 to see. Are you prepared? Yeah. Katori jumps from joy. So what's it gonna be? Beating up bandits? Saving a princess from her evil uncle? Hold your horses, Katori. Naruto pats his daughter on the head. Let Granny speak. Sonata chuckles at the girl's enthusiasm. Oh, I believe you'll be quite surprised by what I have for you. Oh. Is it gonna be? Collecting trash. Katori falls to her knees at the entrance of the landfill. Dad, we're we collecting trash? You're not collecting trash. Naruto weaves the mission scroll in front of them. You're separating trash into recyclables and non-recyclables. And? This helps us how? Shoto crosses his arms. Naruto sighs and stands in front of them in lecture mode. Listen, as Genin, you'll be assigned D-rank missions which involve tasks like this. If you show you're disciplined enough to do these and you do enough of them well, you'll get assigned better missions. This helps you by showing you're capable members of the community. I'm already disciplined. Shoto protests. I train diligently in both my taijutsu and ninjutsu, you know that. Yeah, that's right. Katori echoes him. You're right. And that's only one aspect of life. Naruto points behind him to the landfill. And this is another one. So get going. Missions ranks go from D to S, right? Yakamaru recalls. How many D rank missions do we need to be assigned C rank ones? Well, it depends. If you do exceptionally well, it could be as little as 5 or 10. If you do exceptionally bad, you could be doing them for a year. I'm not cleaning trash for a year. Guys, Katori turns to Yakamaru and Shoto. We gotta get out of these deer ranks as soon as possible. I concur. Shoto nods. I don't know, hasn't it been like this for a long time? If this is how the village works, then we'll start a revolution. Katori raises her fist. Are you Naruto Uzumaki? A man approaches from inside. My name's Tsutomu. We've been expecting you. I am, yeah. Thank you for having us. He shakes hands with the man from the site. The man begins leading them inside. We should be thanking you, extra pairs of hands are always appreciated. I have a list for you of what items are to be destroyed and which are to be left. The man hands over four clipboards to the jonin. Thanks. Naruto redistributes the lists to the kids. Be sure to carefully go through it, guys. You guys are in charge of this area here. Tsutomu motions to an admittedly small part of the landfill, but still containing a sizable amount of garbage. My crew and I will be over on the other end if you need anything. He walks away, waving to the group. All right. Naruto flickers to the top of one particular pile that has a torn up armchair and makes himself as comfortable as he can. You guys better get started. The kid's jaws drop. Wait, you're not helping, Shisho? Shoto asks. What's the big deal, dad? Katori stomps her feet. I'm just here to supervise you and see how well you do your job. Naruto shrugs. So you better do well. That's not fair. Katori argues. Why do you get to relax? Hey, I have a very important job of watching over my precious kids, alright? It's hard work. Yakamaru lets out a whine as he looks over what awaits them. Is this even going to be possible? Shoto sighs and rolls up his sleeves. Best get started then. Katori puffs out her cheeks but begins, with Yakamaru following their lead. 
it's a very slow process of sifting through the mountains of trash and going over which ones need to be set aside for recycling and which for destruction. Their process involves creating brand new mountains by chucking the relevant pieces of trash to their relevant new pile. After that, well, they'll figure something out, one step at a time. Take a piece, throw it to one pile. Take another piece, throw it to the other pile. Over and over. Some of them have gathered grim or are covered in something slimy that's either decomposed food or, nope, rather not think of the alternatives. At one point, they almost find themselves buried when they climb onto a more unstable part of the heap. At least that uncovered more trash, making it easier to spot what they have to work with. It's progress, in some ways. Throughout the entire time, Naruto offers words of encouragement which are met with a lot of grumbling. They diligently work until noon when it's time for their break. Looking at how much they've separated and how much they still have to separate, it's clear it's going to take a long time to get any significant progress done. This is gonna take forever. Katori lies on her back. Shoto sighs. The Hakage did say this mission was expected to take several days. Now we know why. Yakamaru wipes some dirt off his hoodie. This would be much simpler if it wasn't just the three of us. Yes, be a lot better if we had another team to help us. Shoto rolls his shoulders to loosen them up a bit. Or a useful jutsu like Sensei's shadow clones. Yakamaru looks up to Naruto who waves at them from his throne. A useful jutsu. As Katori stares at the skies, something clicks in her mind when they mention the possible backup. She rises from her position and stares at the garbage, a smile creeping onto her face that slowly turns into a grin. We don't need clones when we have a flock. She says as vaguely as possible. The flock? Yakamaru cocks his head. From her seating position, Katori goes through her jutsu's hand signs. Aviary. Sparrows, a flock of about a dozen sparrows spring into existence, circling around them. She focuses her chakra into them, her own eyes changing to resemble a sparrow's. The sudden change is kind of creepy. Naruto grins. Finally. Ninja art. All-encompassing sight. Katori uses all of her training for this menial task. She connects her eyesight to all the sparrows under her control and sends them to pick up trash instead of her, flying it over to the relevant pile. Is this really wise? Shoto looks at the small birds springing into action. Doesn't it strain your mind to have this many at once? It does. But, my birds are able to act on their own, as long as I give them vague enough instruction. If I can get them to learn the process, they should be able to follow it all on their own with little input from me. Wow. Yakamaru admires the uniqueness of her jutsu. I had no idea it worked like that. I've been practicing a lot, you know. It's taken me a while, but I've finally figured out how to actually use my jutsu. There's a lot of parts to it that don't exist in other jutsu, but I think I got to a good level. Eyes are a bit creepy, though. Shoto notes. Well excuse me. Katori yells. It's not like I have any control over this. But I think it's working. Using out jutsu, huh? Shoto strokes his chin. Let's try it. Shoto walks over to the pile that's meant for recycling. She picks out a good spot for what he plans to do. Earth style? Moving earth core, a small square of just about a square meter descends into the ground, taking some of the garbage with it. At Shoto's command, the earth to the side jutsu out to fill the hole before he sends it crashing down into the garbage and then return back into the side. Peeking down, Shoto smirks at the result of his all-natural compressing machine. He walks around and pushes even more trash down the hole, doing the same as before moving a piece of earth to slam down and squash everything to take up much less space. Way to go, Shoto. Katori cheers. We have to be careful with our chakra levels. If we're going to do it like this. I know that. Inspired by their creative thinking, Yakamaru decides to act as well. With Katori and her sparrows in charge of separation, and Shoto in charge of making the recyclable pile more manageable, that leaves only one part of the task. The ones that are meant to be destroyed. They were never told just how they're going to be disposed of, but he might have his own way of doing it. An application of his jutsu that he'd been trying to find ways not to have to resort to, but it seems like his very first missions will force him to do it, anyway. Yakamaru walks over to the pile that they'd already manually gathered, and that the sparrows are in the process of adding, and holds out his hands. Crystal style? Crystal prison, the whole area in front of him before is encased in pink crystals, trapping the trash within it. Pressing his hand against a surface, the crystals shatter into tiny flakes, completely destroying the crystallized garbage. Now, they've found their groove. With their jutsu, their workload is diminished and they're able to work at a much better pace than they were before. 
As the afternoon progresses, their work becomes more ironed out as they get used to each other's timing, even further optimizing their progress. Even Tsutomu is impressed when he drops by at the end of the workday to look at what they've done. Gotta say, you kids work fast. Tsutomu whistles with admiration. Might have to start hiring Shinobi more regularly. Naruto flickers down and pats the closest, Yakumaru, on the head. They're plenty strong and capable. Creative, too. You can count them to work even better tomorrow. The man looks over the compressed stacks that Shoto left to the side. Already crushed, huh? It's definitely easier for transport, but I'm not sure how well they can recycle them like this. Um, sorry. Shoto winces. I got a little carried away. Hey, it's fine. Tsutomu waves off the boy's concern. I'm sure they can figure something out. Looking forward to working with you tomorrow. Have a good one. You, too. Naruto waves to the man as he leaves and turns to the kids. So, how was it? A fine first day of honest work. I'm tired. Yakamaru leans on his sensei, already closing his eyes. Naruto chuckles and pats him on the head. You did good. Why is this more exhausting than training? Shoto groans in pain, his muscles already growing stiff. Is this what we're going to deal with all the time? Katori rubs her legs. I'm already sick of it. Naruto sighs. You know, I had to do these kinda missions when I first started out, too. And I didn't complain about them cause I know how vital they are for the villages. All three of them stare at him blankly. We know that's not true, dad. Katori says. I find it hard to believe, too. Yakamaru looks up at him. There's no way you had the patience for any of this. Shoto hammers in the final nail. Naruto curls up on the ground and cries. You guys. Katori kneels down and pats him on the head. There, there. Come on, let's get you guys home. Dejected, Naruto stands up and dusts himself off. The very moment Katori enters home, she switches off any part of her brain that thinks and moves to the living room on pure instinct alone. Hinata greets them with a smile as they enter. Welcome back, you two. Katori only groans in response and lies on the couch where Hiroto is playing. She curls up and pulls Hiroto to her chest, snuggling up with her baby brother, who immediately begins tugging on her hair and ear, and just about anything he can get a hold of. Love you, too, hero. Katori mutters half asleep. Naruto laughs and walks up to Hinata to wrap his arms around her. We're back. I'd ask how it went, but I think Katori's reaction says it all. She looks up to him and laughs. Yeah. They cleaned up a landfill. Took them about four hours to think of using their jutsu to help get it done faster. That's good. They learn quickly. She leans into her husband's embrace and looks up. Did you help them? I motivated them from the sidelines? Naruto. She playfully taps him on the chest. Don't overwork them. I won't. Now that they've figured out what their jutsu can be used for, I'll help them out tomorrow. We should finish our mission then. He kisses her on the temple. How was your day? Fine. The kids really tuckered themselves out. He looks to the couch where Katori and Hiroto are already fast asleep. Speaking of, I'm probably going to leave before you two. I have an early meeting and will drop Hiroto off with Jugo and Karen. Karen who, may I remind you, has words to exchange with you. He laughs, recalling how furious the woman was at Naruto's self-made decision. I'm sure she does. Naruto chuckles. But she's still the perfect fit for the role when it even comes to it. She has a few years to get used to it. A few years, huh? Not in a rush to become Hakage anytime soon? Nah. Naruto walks over to the couch and gently picks up the sleeping Katari. I got something more important to do right now. He says quietly as he now holds his daughter in his arms to take her up to her room. Put her in her bed, I'll take her gear off. Hinata says as she in turn picks up the sleeping Hiroto. The next day, Team 9 continues their first mission of clearing the landfill, this time working at a much more impressive rate. Since they've learned how to actually use their jutsu in different ways, Naruto helps them a bit more to get everything cleaned out by the end of the day. There's even another team from their class that comes to start working on a different part of the landfill. They initially struggle with the task just as Team 9 did, but on seeing the use of jutsu to speed up the process, they begin making use of their own skills to aid in the mission. At the end of the day, they all stand in front of the clear section that they spent two whole days clearing out. They're sweaty and tired, but also a bit proud of their work. So, figure out a victory pose, Naruto pats Katori on the head. Doesn't feel like much of a victory. Maybe some other time. Shoto shakes his head. Of course you'd have a victory pose. When will our next mission be, sensei? Yakamaru asks. Not tomorrow, I can tell you that much. Naruto laughs. Rest up, you'll probably be a bit sore. 
This kinda manual labor is different from any physical training you've done so far. Hey, Yakamaru turns to his teammates, want to celebrate tomorrow? Definitely. Katori grins. You can treat yourself using your very first paycheck. Naruto ushers them to head out and head home. It feels really good. Our first mission, complete, huh? Shoto looks back to see just how wide of an area they've cleared. Not what I expected, but. This kind of training isn't so bad, either. Well, I'm glad you liked it cause there's a lot more where that came from. Naruto laughs. Is it too late to change my mind? Yep. Over the next few days, Team 9 take on several more D-rank missions, of varying levels of complexity. One involved the ever-present missing cat mission, where Katori's sparrows saved the day. The initial plan was to use the sparrows to look over a white area, but the low-flying birds attracted the cat's attention, and it started to chase the small birds. In the end, Katori lured the cat right to them, resulting in an unexpected use of her jutsu. The kitty's hunter instincts betrayed at this time. Another request came from the post office, with packages that needed to be delivered to a few nearby towns and villages. It took them a whole day to run around to make the full round of delivery, and they returned well past sundown. Another mission that was a bit more manual labor was assisting with construction work. Yakamaru and Shoto used their crystal and earth styles to create elevated ground that helped with carrying supplies up to higher floors that are being built. That, combined with their ability to cling to vertical surfaces to better place beams, made them good assistance. Currently, Team 9 is at a farming village, about half a days away from the Hidden Leaf. Actually, Team 5 are here, too, just at a different farm down the road. As the six of them have been busy with their new jobs, they haven't had much time to meet up, so they agreed to hang out after they're done here. Team 9's mission is to tend to crops. With the season here, the strawberries are bearing fruit, and other produce needs to be planted, like tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. Naruto sits on the house veranda with the elderly woman. Thank you so much, dear. She sips him a cup of tea. I haven't been as able these past few years. Young ninja have been great helpers. I hope my kids live up to your standards. Naruto bows his head lightly as he takes the cup. I'm sure they will. She smiles. Are they going to be all right on their own, though? Don't worry, they got it handled. Naruto looks over to the fields. Geared with the needed equipment, hoes, rakes, planters, baskets, and sacks of seed, the kids look over the fairly large farming grounds they need to tend to. So, how do we split this? Yakamaru asks. I think my role's obvious. Shoto pops his knuckles. I'll get the soil ready for planting. You guys do the planting? Sounds good to me. Katori agrees. Actually, Yakamaru offers his two cents, I could use my medical ninjutsu to make sure the strawberries are growing healthy. Heal the ones that aren't doing well. Shoto furrows his brow. You can do that? Yakamaru nods. Yeah. Part of our training at the academy was to restore wilted leaves, and such so I should be able to do something while I pick them. Whoa, that's pretty awesome. Katori pats him hard on the back. So it can be used to heal plants, too, not just people? Yeah. Yakamaru smiles, happy that he's able to do this much to help. All right, then I'll put my sparrows to work on both fronts. Let's go. Katori sounds the battle cry. As agreed, they each get to their assigned workplaces. Shoto smooths over and softens the soil so it can be used to plant fresh produce, while Yakamaru gathers fruit and restores the ones not doing too well. Katori has her sparrows helping on both fronts. Pick strawberries and place them in the basket, and dig holes in the turned soil and plant seeds and saplings. When Shoto finishes taking care of the soil, he begins planting, as well. It's hard work and it takes them the better part of the day, but they work hard and they work well. In the afternoon, Naruto does join in and helps them, using only a few shadow clones to speed up the process. At the neighboring farm, Team 5's mission is to take care of the farm animals. Kashiwama is stationed at the pig pen. His task? Clean the pigs. He'd practiced for these past couple years to use the medical water style in a wider range, and not just on a single target, driven by his desire to become a great medic like his great-grandfather. Medical water style? Forest. Currently, that jutsu is being used to cover a portion of the pig pen and create softer mud for the pigs to roll in. Medical jutsu can not only be used to heal wounds, but also ease aches. He's essentially giving them all a spa day. Kashiwama sits on the top of the fence as he holds the jutsu, barely even paying attention to it. He sighs deeply. Did the first or second ever have to do this? In his musings he doesn't notice one of the pigs walk over to him and bite down on his pants. As Kashiwama was embracing himself, it doesn't take much of a tug to send him flying into the mud face first. 
The pigs gather around him as if mocking. Kashiwama slowly fits his mud-caked face and washes it away. I hate this, he whines. Over on the other side of the farm, Genzai and Jiriki are having a cleaner time, if not more entertaining. Some of the horses manage to break the fence and run out, and it's their job to chase them back. Genzai, being the speedier of the group, is out there to get in their way and prevent them from getting any farther away. This running around isn't getting me far. Genzai muses. In a desperate act, he bites down on his thumb and smears blood across his palm. Ninja art. Summoning, two small monkeys pop into the field from a puff of smoke. Enki, Enka, help me get these guys back. Horses? Enki laughs. We're you playing with horses when you have us, silly? You're silly. Can we ride them? Enka hops in place. I'm gonna ride them. She immediately darts over to try and climb one. As long as you help me get them back, I don't really care. Genzai says in a tired voice. Staying back by the fence gate, Jiriki is armed with his bow and biakugan, firing arrows to spook the horses back if they try to spread out too much. This is what I'm using my bow on. Jiriki sighs. So undignified. Jiriki notices one of Genzai's monkeys, he's not sure which he never bothered to tell them apart, grab his arrows and charge at the horses like a spearman. If they break my arrows, you're paying for them. Jiriki says to no one in particular. Eventually, they manage to round them all up. Enki and Enka roll in on horseback, laughing their hearts out. A farmhand comes in just as they finish. Jiriki. He calls out to the young Yuga. We need your help. One of our cows is going through a rough birth. Jiriki stares at him in confusion. Why am I needed for that? Shino-sensei, meanwhile, has several kakechu roaming the area to rid the farm of harmful parasites and to clean the animals on a scale not even humans can. The much larger dog-sized kadechu also roam the area, helping carry heavy loads. It took the farm hands some time to get used to the terrifying sight, and while they're still creeped out by it, they're not as grossed out by them. At the end of the day, as agreed, Team 9 and Team 5 meet up after a hard day's work. Exhausted, tired, and out of energy, they gather by the side of the road, Genzai lying down, while the rest sit around. Jiriki is being oddly distant, sitting atop a wooden fence with his back to the group and staring into the horizon. Genzai groans as he turns over to his side. This is the worst. You guys not having fun either, huh? Katori chuckles. Come on, let out your complaints. We can suffer together. Kashiwama's whole body trembles. Why would I complain? His eye twitches. These missions are important for the economy. His foot vibrates. They're an important part of our careers. You know you can just say it, we're all on the same boat. Katori prods him. Of course I hate them. Kashiwama falls to his knees and slams the ground as hard as he can. I wanted to punch bandits, not use my earth style to give pigs soothing mud baths. I had to use mine too till the soil. Shoto sympathizes. At least your job was cleaner than mine. Kashiwama whines. Shoto takes a whiff of the air around his friend, reeling back from the stench. Yeah, looks like it. I actually kind of enjoyed it. Yakamaru meekly adds. It's nice to know our jutsu can be used to help everyone like this. He looks down to his palms with a smile. And he ruined it. Katori sighs. Why do you have to be so kind and understanding, Yakamaru? Kashiwama wonders. I'm sorry? He shrinks back in his seat. Shoto notices that Jiriki has been oddly quiet the entire time. The young Yuga has barely moved in his spot of staring into the horizon with a blank stare, eyes devoid of any spark. His usual snarky and arrogant comments are nowhere to be heard. Shoto leans to Kashiwama and Genzai and whispers. What's up with him? He had to assist with some cow births. Genzai whispers back. I think he saw things. The Byakugan is a curse. Jiriki mutters to himself, a single tear rolling down his cheek. All right, then. The rest shuffle to the side to give Jiriki some apparently needed space. The team sensei both stand some ways away from them, but still close enough to keep an eye on them. Shino stands by a fence while Naruto is sitting down and leaning against it. Kids doing good? Naruto asks. They are. Shino nods. They've done remarkably well so far. Growing impatient with dear ank missions, though. Naruto laughs in sympathy. I know that. I don't think they'll be happy with just doing chores for much longer. You think Team 5 is ready for seer ranks? In truth, they always were. I don't doubt that they would have completed a seer rank mission flawlessly. However, what they lacked was patience and discipline, Shino looks down at Naruto, with an unreadable expression hidden behind his glasses, but most importantly, they lacked creative thinking which Team 9 helped with. We did? Naruto raises a brow. Yes, that's because. 
Team Nine's use of Jutsu for their first mission was heard of by all other teams. They started looking at their abilities in a new light and started thinking in new ways. Naruto just shrugs. Don't feel like it was anything all that. Feels like the obvious solution, doesn't it? If you're struggling with something, you use anything you got to fix it. Just happens to be Jutsu in this case. I knew the kids would figure out it'd be faster that way, they just needed to realize it, too. Shino mutters under his breath. And that's why you're perfect for this job. Hmm? Naruto cocks his head. What was that? Nothing? Shino straightens himself. To answer your previous question. Yes, I believe Team 5 is more than ready to do seer rank missions. They've the proper mindset for it now. I assume the same goes for Team 9. Pretty much. I think they've already proven what they had to prove, so I'll ask Granny if she's got something for us. I plan to do the same. Shino says. Team 5 has been very motivated as of late. They won't lose out to Team 9. He begins walking back to the farm. Same. Naruto stands up and grins. So, should we go tell them they'll be rid of Deer Ank missions soon? I believe some motivation would be good for them, yes. Shino agrees. Naruto pats Shino on the back. Give my best to Shiho and Shichi, yeah? And to Hinata and Hiroto, as well. The two flicker over to their students' sides in an instant, startling them with the sudden appearance. You guys ready to head back? Naruto asks with more enthusiasm than the six of them combined. Yeah, Katori says as she stands up. Before they remember some other chore we need to do. Shoto adds with a grim chuckle. You bite your tongue. Kashiwama says. Well, don't worry, you might not be doing this for long. Naruto reassures them. It takes a moment for the kid's tired brains to register his words. You mean. Katori's lips slowly grow into a wide grin. That's right. Shino interjects. We're going to recommend both teams for seer rank missions. Yes. They all exclaim, save for Jiriki who's still spacing out. Katori and Kashiwama high-five each other hard enough to redden their hands. Finally. Now we can show what we're made of. Shoto clenches his fist. I hope we're ready for it. Yakamaru nervously tugs on his leather harness. Don't worry. Genzai pats him on the back. We got this. They all chatter away at their excitement of going up in the ranks and guessing what big missions they'll take part in. Just no, Shino tries to ground them, there's no guarantee that. They're not listening. Naruto laughs and pats him on the shoulder. Let them have their moment. We can give them the lecture some other time. Amaka. Kashiwama pokes Jiriki on the back. No response. Man, he's really out of it. Just what happened in the cow pen. Gen's eye walks around and places a hand on Jiriki's arm. You okay, buddy? Jiriki slowly turns his head to stare at Genzai with empty eyes. No. Come on, let's get you home. Kashiwama helps him get down from the fence. We can get you some natto on the way home. Genzai offers. That'd be nice. Jiriki nods. End of chapter 65. Name meanings. Tsutomu equals worker. Author's note. People often complain when fanfiction gives Tsunada the clan name Senju, because canonically she's never called that. I heavily dislike that complaint. She's not some random street urchin. We know she's from by far the most prestigious bloodline there is, so she'd obviously have a family name of some kind. There's literally no reason for that name to not be Senju. Chapter 66, Mission 2, C Rank. With advancement, there's always going to be a little bit of worry. Certain expectations are placed on you by people you trust and who trust you in return, so you have to make sure not to disappoint. While his friends are eager to do higher and more difficult missions, Yakamaru's worried what exactly it'll entail and whether they won't go in over their heads. Still, he can't exactly show it to the others, right? Have to be strong and not let them down. He dons his outfit, saving the headband for last, and makes his way downstairs to the oddly empty and quiet house, save for the sound of cheerful giggling outside, no doubt the twins playing. He grabs a packed lunch off the table that his mom had made after breakfast and makes his way out, where his suspicions are confirmed. Byakuren and Jayuji are running for dear life, or as fast their little three-year-old legs can take them, from Ayama who's chasing them around the front yard. As soon as they spot him leave the house, however, they immediately dart to hug him around the legs. Yoku. Byakuren grins up at him. Are you leaving? Are you gonna go do something cool? Can we come? Jayuji looks at him with pleading eyes. We can learn cool ninjutsu. Yakamaru laughs and pats them both on the head. It's a little early, don't you think? 
you'll get in the academy soon enough. Aw, oh, no fair. They both pout. Ayama comes to them and ushers the twins inside. Come on, your cousin is busy. You can hound him all you want when he comes back. Will you tell us stories, Yoku? Byakuran hops in place. Of course. Yakamaru grins. Satisfied, the two run in sight and suddenly Yakamaru's worries are lessened. When he knows he has the two little ones that look up to him, his mind becomes clearer as to what he needs to do. Rather than adding pressure, it's an oddly calming thought. Are you all set? Ayama snaps him out of his musing. Yep. All good for my first C-rank mission. He looks around both houses. Is everyone else out? Pretty much. She sighs. Dad and your mom are on shift at Ramen Ichiraku, Gurin and Gozu both have missions, and Yukimaru is working at the library, so that leaves me with the kids. Can you manage them? Yakamaru chuckles. Of course I can, they're dolls. Except when they're not. Which is most of the time, really. What about you? Nervous about your first C-rank mission? A little bit. He tugs at his leather harness. Worried about what it'll be. Well, don't be. Ayama ruffles his hair. We've all seen how hard you've been training and how motivated you are. If anyone's ready, it's you. Thanks. Now you best get going, your friend is waiting for you. Ayama points to the nearby rooftop. Shoto waves from a distance, beckoning Yakamaru to hurry up. Ah, right. Yakamaru gives his stepsister a quick hug and rushes off. See you later. Maybe. Team 9 enters the mission assignment room, eager to receive their first higher ranked mission and show what they've got. They stand in front of the long desk where the people tasked with this job are sitting. Unlike when they received their very first mission, Sonata is nowhere in sight. The man sitting in the middle hands the scroll to Naruto. Your mission is as follows. There have been numerous sightings of giant sand cobras migrating from the land of wind to the land of fire. They need to be stopped before they damage the local ecosystem. Oh, we have to hunt snakes? Katori drags her heel across the ground. Poor things. How much harm could some snakes do? Yeah, why exactly are we needed? Shoto asks. Isn't there like wildlife preservation or something? It's because, Naruto explains, a full-grown giant sand cobra can reach something like 50 meters, 160 feet, in length. It can easily swallow all four of us in one bite. Katori can feel her heart jump up to her throat. Uh, okay. I think I'm fine with hunting them now. Why does a snake even need to be that big? Shoto shudders. Isn't that? A lot, sensei. Yakamaru looks worried. Sasuke's summons are way bigger, though. Naruto thinks but decides not to scare them too much. Ha, huh, you guys'll be fine. And if not, I'll be there, too, remember? Whatever you can't handle, I'll take on. Further details on sightings and movement patterns are given in the mission brief, but it doesn't sound like there are any adults, so you won't be fighting anything quite that big. Are we to chase them back or kill them? Naruto asks. Kill. We don't have the time to relocate them, and the land of rivers is already having enough trouble with them passing through once, we don't need to cause them any more headaches. All right. If we're heading to the border with the land of rivers, that's gonna be a solid day of travel. Hope you guys are ready for a trip. Naruto turns to his group. Say, Katori addresses the man at the desk. Has Team 5 already gotten their mission? Team 5? He furrows his brow. Shino Aburama's team, yes, they took their mission a while ago, subjugating giant crazy ants to the north. They've most likely already set out. Ants, huh? Guess Shino would be the guy for that job. Naruto jokes. Then we can't lose to them. We gotta finish our mission before them. Katori pumps her fist. Naruto chuckles. That might be difficult since their mission is probably closer than ours. They might be done before we even get to the border. Then we run like the wind. Katori flickers to the open window behind the desk, kneeling on the windowsill as she beckons her team. Let's go, I'm up for a little race. Shoto smirks and jumps through, as well. Ah. The man behind the desk looks around in a panic. Don't jump through the window. Yakamaru follows. Use the door. The man shouts after them. Naruto laughs, kids, am I right? And flickers out the window. The man slumps in his chair with a defeated sigh. Crazy Ant Subjugation Mission about half a day's travel from the Hidden Leaf, Team 5 find themselves at the small village suffering from an infestation of ants. Even before entering the village proper or meeting anyone, they can already see the damage dealt to the lands around it. Both farming plots and green areas have been upturned, multiple burrowed holes lining the ground to the point of even knocking down trees. Ants did all of this? Kashiwama looks around. Not just ordinary ants. Shino clarifies. Giant crazy ants. 
So is there any particular reason they're called that? Genzai asks. In truth, their name is the long-legged ant, but their occasional erratic behavior has led to their nickname, Crazy Ant. Ants, as you may be aware, are extraordinarily organized creatures, they diligently follow set patterns and work with efficiency and unity, and can quickly return to those patterns if they're disturbed. I'm assuming that's not true for these ones. Jiriki looks around the destruction. He focuses his chakra to his eyes, veins popping out. By Akugan, he scans their immediate area. That's correct. The long-legged ant goes into a panic if their pattern is disturbed. The smaller variants do no harm and eventually do find their way. These larger ones, however, cause damages such as this. So what do we do? Kashiwama slams his fist into his palm. Kill them all? Set them on fire? Genzai lightly prods Kashiwama's side. Did you forget Sensei's and Aburama? Oh, right. No, Kashiwama's correct. Shino says. They are an invasive species and cannot continue existing here without negatively impacting the wider area. As much as it pains me to say, we must rid the land of them. He then turns to the young Yuga. Juriki? Nothing here. Juriki shakes his head. Either their nest is out of my range, or it's somewhere else. Then we'll search for it. Shino's coat billows out as swarms of insects fly out from seemingly nowhere. They spread out in smaller groups and go to cover a white area to search. Team 5's questioning of the village folk doesn't really bear much fruit. They don't exactly know much about the ants to begin with, they weren't even aware a colony was so dangerously close to their home, but they could tell more or less what damage was caused when. Due to the chaotic nature of the crazy ants, a pattern can't wholly be established, but it may aid in finding out where they originally came from. Having a source may lead to the cause of this problem. By the end of the questioning, some of Shino's kakechu return, as well. Key word being some. As part of his extensive training, Shino, as any member of the Abu Rama clan, knows the unique chakra signature of each and every insect he houses in his body. Thanks to that, he knows which ones are missing and where he sent them to search. Team 5. He addresses his group. It seems the ants are spread out through the entire woods surrounding the forest. The kakechu I sent forth have been killed. I want you to go to the locations with stragglers. My kakechu will get in. What'll you do, sensei? Kashiwama asks. I'll search for the nest. Shino sends out a few of his insects to guide them, just in case multiple are needed. It's odd, though. Where the most kakechu were killed should be where they're gathered, their nest, but it's far from where the villagers said the attacks started. As the kids run ahead, Jiriki activates his biakugan at certain intervals to check their immediate surroundings. It takes a bit of running around and following Shino-sensei's insect, but eventually. There's a group on R2. Jiriki alters his course, jumping up the tree line to get higher ground. Kashiwama and Genzai follow him and, sure enough, see a small group of human-sized yellow ants skittering about and seemingly doing nothing, with abnormally long legs as their real name would suggest. Kashiwama whistles lightly. I guess that's where the giant part of giant crazy ant comes from. They're still just ants. Jiriki summons his bow from storage and draws the string, an arrow appearing from the storage seals on the bow itself. It being big just means there's more of it to squash. He carefully aims, lines up his shot, and fires. The arrow goes right for one of the ant's heads. Just as the arrow's about to strike, the ant twists its head to dodge out of the way. It lifts one of its legs and brings it down on the ground, snapping the arrow in half. It turns its head to the tree where the arrow came from and emits a clicking sound from, alerting the rest. Jiriki clicks his tongue. These things, they're not normal ants, that's for sure. Genzai jumps out of the tree and makes his move. Let's blind them. Fire style? Flame bullet. He breathes out a continuous stream of fire. Kashiwama jumps down to ground level and acts in accordance to his friend. Water style? Water bullet. He spits out a stream of pressurized water, aiming to mow down all the ants by sweeping his jutsu horizontally. Some of the ants jump up to avoid, but others aren't as fast and are sent crashing back. One of the ants that jumps up is struck by Genzai's fire, which not not burns away at it, but collides with Kashiwama's water. The impact of fire on water covers the entire area in a cloud of fog that no one can see through. No one except for Jiriki. He immediately sends out a volley of arrows at the disoriented insects. Some he manages to strike the soft parts of but others hit the carapace which proves sturdier than expected. He also noticed them begin to stir and run toward the edge of the cloud. Kashiwama, three right in front of you. Genzai, two on your right. Got it. Kashiwama goes through his hand signs, prepared for the fog to be broken. As soon as the ants appear, he slams his hands on the ground. Earth style? 
ground bedrock. The ground on both sides of the ants begins to shift, two large squares breaking off flying up to create a natural press that squishes one of them, but the others prove faster than expected. They rush at Kashiwama and strike down with their legs to leave large and dense. Kashiwama tries to dodge to the side, but he's about to find out why they're called the long-legged ants. The one closest to him raises its leg and extends it at a great speed, having a much greater reach than initially expected. Kashiwama is struck in the stomach and sent flying back. Kashiwama, Genzai calls out, but he has his own ants to deal with, much faster than one might assume. I got him. Jiriki says as he readies another arrow, this one tipped with a glass-like blunt tip. He lets the arrow loose at the first ant and himself flickers to the other one. It readies a kick just like with Kashiwama, but the sudden appearance of Jiriki catches it by surprise, and its reaction is slow. The odd arrow then strikes, the blunt tip shattering on impact and causing the ant to violently convulse. One blow. Body, Jiriki sends out a burst of chakra from every single chakra point in his body. The wave knocks the ant off its balance. Kashiwama acts, with one ant stunned and the other off balance, slamming his hands on the ground, in spite of the pain in his stomach. Earth style? Ground bedrock. As before, two plates rise from the ground to crush both of them, ending their fight. To the side, Genzai is finishing up his own battle. The entire area is lined with kunai, wire strings, all leading to the young Saratobi. He leaps into the air, over the ants and binds them with the wires. Fire style? Dragon fire. Genzai sends out streams of fire through the wire strings and burns the ants to a crisp. They fall to the ground and the kids breathe a relieved sigh. Genzai looks around for any more threats, and when he sees none, he deactivates his biakigan. We good? Genzai asks. For now. There's a cave not far from here that has ant markings. They've been coming in and out of there. Might be good to check it out, then. Genzai then turns to Kashiwama who's already applying his mystical palm to his wounds. How are you? I'll be fine in a minute. He groans. They hit harder than I thought. Can you keep going? Jiriki asks. Of course. Kashiwama flashes a grin. Just who do you think you're talking to? On the other side of the forest, Shino stands surrounded by a small army of giant ants, all in the process of being consumed by his kakechu. He kneels down and rolls one to its side to examine it more closely. This is odd. All of these are workers. If their nest is somewhere in the vicinity, then there should be signs of guards, as well. Unless. I need to get back to the kids. Shino rushes off back from where he just came from. Please stay safe. Going through the cavern Jiriki found, Team 5 make their way through winding corridors, guided by the Byakugan which can see traces of previous movement, no matter how small or insignificant. No signs of ants themselves, though. Some tunnels are very clearly not natural and not man-made, making it even easier to guess where the right way is. They walk slowly and quietly so as to not attract any unwanted attention, only carrying a flashlight to light their way. Eventually the dusty and suffocating caverns lead them to a giant chamber that has multiple similar caverns, lining the entirety of its walls. The chamber itself has the very visible signs of a cave-in, with much of the floor being covered in boulders and earth, the chamber itself being oddly misshapen, and even some of the tunnels being collapsed. Do you think this is like a nest? Kashiwama wonders. Couldn't be. Genzai answers. Didn't Shino-sensei go to the nest? Then we're good, right? Let's see what else we gotta kill. Kashiwama hops off the edge of their tunnel to get into the chamber proper. Oi. Jiriki calls out to him. Don't just jump in on your own. Do you see anything? Genzai asks. Not here, no. Jiriki shakes his head, still keeping his Byakugan active. Genzai shrugs and hops off, too. Then we may as well look around. With a defeated sigh, Jiriki goes in, too. The three look around the tunnels for any signs of life or even death. As they get closer, something comes within Jiriki's range, a fairly large ant crushed under some rubble in the far back of the chamber. Guess a cave-in did some of our job for us, Jiriki says. Then, something else enters his range. Coming from the ceiling just above the tunnel they came from, Jiriki sees a gigantic form, several times larger than the ones they killed earlier. Because he was so far away from the tunnel, he only sees it at the very last moment. Incoming, Jiriki calls out a warning to his team they all ready themselves for combat. The giant ant burrows its way through, falling to the ground with dust and rubble, showing itself to everyone. Standing at well over 4 meters 13 feet in height, the giant warrior ant screeches, its mighty legs cracking the ground underneath it, its head whipping around to stare right at. With little to no warning, it rushes at them with great speed, much faster than the kids could have ever expected. 
Kashiwama slams his hands on the ground. Earth style? Earth wall. A small wall of stone rises from the ground with the intent of stopping or at least slowing down the warrior ant, but it outruns the rising earth, even having enough time to crush it with its back legs. Jiriki steps in front of him with just barely enough time to try keep the ant at bay. 8 trigrams? Vacuum palm. He thrusts his hand forward, creating a vortex of pure chakra bursting from his hand, but the ant dodges to the side. It slams several of its legs on the ground in an attempt to squash the kids. Kashiwama and Jiriki dodge backward while Genzai jumps up, trying to get all of its legs in his sight for a jutsu that can target and potentially take out its massive appendages. Fire style? Phoenix Sage Phi. His jutsu is interrupted when a giant leg slams him square in the chest. He manages to bring his shielded arms to protect from the brunt of it, but that leaves a crack in his armored plates. He's sent flying into a wall. Genzai. Kashiwama shouts at his friend for confirmation that he's fine. None comes. Kashiwama. Focus. Jiriki warns. Can you get me onto its back? I don't think I'm fast enough alone. Kashiwama growls but turns his focus to the ant. I can't but I'm not leaving Genzai there. That's fine. Just get me up there. Jiriki begins running at top speed, firing several of his special arrows. They're not as effective at stunning this one as they were with the smaller ones, but it serves as a good distraction, at the very least. Kashiwama, not wanting to needlessly draw its attention, runs over to Genzai, while Jiriki finds a way to get closer to the monstrous ant. When Jiriki starts running toward it rather than around it, it prepares to strike on as it's been doing until now. Now, Jiriki shouts. Kashiwama slams his hands on the ground. Earth style? Ground bedrock. As before, two plates of stone rise up, but this time not with the intent to sandwich whatever stands between them. One of the plates forms right under Jiriki's feet, giving him a boost in height. The ant tries to stomp on him, but by the time it does, he's already in the air, and all it stomps on is Kashiwama's earth style. The second plate comes from the other side and actually manages to slightly knock it off its balance. Jiriki lands on its back, clinging to it with his chakra. With the operation successful, Kashiwama turns to Genzai, who's holding his arms. Medical water style? Forest. He immediately begins healing his teammate with his watery woodlands. Thanks. Genzai manages to grunt out a word of gratitude. Save your strength. Kashiwama keeps a close eye on Jiriki. The young Yuga does his best to make use of his new position. With his Byakugan, he focuses on the giant ant's weak points. Running across its back, he strikes down at the chakra points within range. 8 trigrams. 32 palms. The ant cries out in pain and begins violently contorting its body to shake off the unwanted intruder. When it rolls around on its side, Jiriki takes that as a hint to jump off to avoid being crushed by its massive weight. Jiriki would have preferred to not put himself in such a vulnerable position, knowing full well what these ants seemingly love to kick with their many legs, but it's better than being trampled. Besides, he just might have the tool for the job. As expected, the ant goes to kick its defenseless target. When the leg gets close, Jiriki opens every single chakra point in his body to create a force of chakra power, enough to get him out of harm's way. One blow. Body. Jiriki crashes on the ground skids back, getting some distance, but the angered ant screeches and follows him, swinging its legs around to step on him. Water style. Water bullet. Fire style. Flame bullet. A stream of pressurized water and a cone of fire shoot over Jiriki's head to get the ant off his tail. He hops back to his team to strategize, his Byakugan now deactivated. Just so you know, Kashiwama pants, I don't actually have a lot of chakra left. I can fire off a couple small ones or a big one, Genzai stands up by propping himself against the wall. I'm going to make an opening where it can dodge our attacks. Jiriki proclaims. Think you can do that? Genzai asks. I think so, but it's going to use up every bit of chakra I have left. If we fail this, it's over. Jiriki points to the far right-hand corner of the chamber. If you can, push it over there. I'll take care of the rest. Jiriki runs forward, his teammates putting all of their trust into him, and whatever his idea is. He readies his bow as he runs, summoning arrows wrapped in paper tags. Firing them as he runs forward, they detonate mid-air before even reaching the ant, surrounding the entire area in a smokescreen. By Akugan, he runs in before the ant can move away, taking position just under its body. He jumps up and opens his chakra points, this time exerting a much greater force than before. Jiriki lets out a shout as he forces much more power out of himself than he's ever needed to before. One blow. Burst. A violent explosion of chakra sends the smoke screens away, clearing the whole area. The ant is just as unable to resist the force that hit its thorax. 
The violent thrashing of its legs manages to hit Yuriki who's sent crashing to the ground, but the deed is done. The ant is airborne and unable to use its speed to escape. Water style? Water severing wave. Kashiwama spits a high pressurized stream of water, exuding much greater force than anything he's used up until now. Fire style? Fire dragon flame bullet. Genzai breathes a fire of intense heat, the initial breath curving around him almost like a shield. Both jutsu strike the giant ant and knock in the exact direction Juriki said to. The Hyuga manages to get his bearings enough to draw his bow, summoning an arrow wrapped in explosive tags. He fires it at the ant, curving it in a way that it wouldn't be detonated too early by Genzai's jutsu. When the explosion detonates, the entire cavern rumbles and shakes, loose rocks falling from the walls and ceiling. The corner the ant was thrown in crumbles and falls onto it, crushing its body under massive boulders. We gotta get out. Kashiwama calls out. No. Genzai places an arm on his shoulder. I think we are fine. They both look at Juriki, who's still on the ground and not making any moves to get away. After a few short seconds, the rumbling stops and Juriki stands up to his feet. Kashiwama and Genzai run up to him. That was awesome. Kashiwama slaps him on the back. Did you know that was gonna happen? Juriki composes himself after the slap nearly knocked him off his balance. I looked over the cavern while I was running around and saw some structural integrity. That corner was in a position where we could crumble it without bringing the whole thing under us. I'm impressed. Genzai chuckles. This much is as to be expected. Juriki boasts. This is the might of the Byakugan. Kashiwama pokes one of Juriki's mini bruises. Is this also the Byakugan's might? Ow. He hisses in pain. Kashiwama begins healing the more severe injuries, his hand glowing a distinct green color. Mystical palm, we ought to go find Shino-sensei as soon as we get healed up. Genzai looks over his surroundings. Not liking this place one bit. They sit by the entrance for a few minutes to get their breath and energy back after exhausting most if not all of their resources. Kashiwama's chakra doesn't last him long enough to fully heal everyone, so resorts to healing bombs which help some, but not as much as medical ninjutsu. As they sit, the cavern rumbles again. Another cave-in? Kashiwama stands, ready to get out of there. I don't think so. Juriki looks around. He activates his Byakugan using whatever chakra he has left. It doesn't last him long, but it's enough for him to stumble back in shock. More are coming. He says in a wispy voice. The walls and ceiling burst, multiple additional tunnels openings up. From the dust and rubble, an army of ants spring forth. Most of them are small workers, but four of them are giant warriors like the one they just fought. All of them skitter in the kid's direction. Shit. Juriki curses. Their legs tremble. They know they have to escape, to get as far away from here as possible. Just one of the big ones gave them so much trouble, and yet there's more of them in addition to the smaller ones. Genzai falls to his knees. There's no way we can win this. Oi, we gotta go. Kashiwama calls out despite his own body refusing to move. We gotta run back to Shino-sensei. Just then, as they helplessly observe the army coming toward them, something passes by them. Something small and flying that they'd completely forgotten about until now. Shino's insects that he'd initially sent with them go into the cavern. They land on the ants at the front and burrow into their bodies. After a moment, the ants burst from the inside out, in their guts now standing Shino's Kadechu. The Kadechu then move in to devour as many ants as they can before being overwhelmed. However, they manage to hold off long enough for swarms of Kakechu to fly in and completely overwhelm all the ants. The kids stare in disbelief as Shino calmly walks behind them. I miscalculated and put you all in danger. Please accept my deepest apologies. I thought where the most giant ants had gathered would be where their nest is, but didn't take into account that that location is where they ran to from their nest, and not their actual nest. Shino-sensei. Kashiwama falls to the ground, leaning against Shino's leg. You've all done exceptionally well. Leave the rest to us. It only takes a couple of minutes of intense fighting, giant ants versus kakechu, for the parasitic insects to wind out, devouring even the much larger warrior ants. With the battle won, Shino steps into the cavern to observe the situation. Whoa, Kashiwama stares. I had no idea Shino-sensei was that strong. I've heard stories of the Aburama clan but never seen any of them in real combat. Genzai stands up to his feet, no longer trembling. He doesn't even need to fight. Juriki states. He has his own personal army with him. They walk over to their sensei, carefully stepping around insect guts. So, is it over? Genzai asks. I believe so. Shino extends a hand for one particular insect, after emerging from a pile of rubble that was there prior, to land on his finger. 
I believe I've discovered what incited their erratic behavior. Their queen had died. Crushed under soil. That one's their queen? Jeriki sighs. I saw it with my Byakugan, but didn't think it's an important one. Well, I suppose it's no longer important to us as there's nothing we could have done about it. We've completed our mission, regardless. Prepare to return to the Hidden Leaf. Wait, Kashiwama steps forward, we're leaving already? You take issue with that? Shino asks. I mean. Yeah. We gotta help the villagers. They've had their farms destroyed and their animals killed, we can't just leave them. Our mission was to deal with the giant ants, and we've done precisely that. Anything else falls beyond the scope of our mission. But, Sensei's right. Juriki interjects. The villagers can take care of they can't, they can file a deer ank mission to get aid. Sensei. Genzai speaks up. Can we say with certainty that we've accomplished our mission? Are we sure we've dealt with all the ants? Isn't it our duty to remain until we know for a fact that we've done what we were sent out to do? Even you, Genzai? Juriki narrows his eyes. Shino takes a moment to contemplate, looking into the distance which isn't all that distance given there in a cave. You are correct. My Kikachu found and took care of some stragglers, but there may be more in hiding who may return to find their whole nest dead. Then. Kashiwama cheers up. We have to stay longer, right? It appears that may be necessary. Shino nods. All right. Kashiwama jumps in place and pats Genzai on the back. Let's go check on everyone. Jiriki rolls his eyes. Great. Shino chuckles. Seems your exhaustion has already faded. Come, let's return to the village. Kashiwama runs ahead, followed by Shino and Genzai, with Jiriki dragging his feet behind them. As they leave, the Kakechu fly back to Shino, returning within his body. Giant Cobra Subjugation Mission Arriving at the border between the land of fire and land of rivers, it doesn't actually take Naruto long to figure out where their targets are. With his sage mode, he can sense over a fair distance and is already tracking the cobra's movement. Of course, he's keeping silent to allow the kids to show what they can do. Since the cobras are large in size, that means they leave very visible tracks wherever they slither to, which makes their trails easy to spot. Team 9 keeps to the trees, certain that such big animals wouldn't be able to climb and remain unseen. Katori, as the de facto scout, has her sparrows flying around as lookouts, keeping two above the tree line and watching for any suspicious and overly large movement. From time to time she stops to look through their eyes with her all-encompassing sight. Who knew giant snakes were difficult to find? Shoto chuckles. Aren't they, like, good at hiding? Yakamaru wonders. Makes sense, right? Some of them are. Katori snaps out of her trance. But these guys live in the desert so they shouldn't really be good at hiding in grass and trees. You studied up on snakes or something? Shoto cocks his head. Of course. Plenty of birds actually eat snakes, so I've looked into their diets. Katori boasts. Also, I found some. What, already? Shoto sounds surprised. Didn't take long, did it? Told you, Katori grins, they're not good at hiding in green. Naruto smiles as he runs behind them, having the kids take the lead on this one. Good job. After a short run through the canopies, Team 9 notices more and more trees knocked over, snapped in half, or just damaged in some ways like their branches being torn off. The signs of a slithering giant become more and more prominent. At the end, they find themselves at the top of a hill, looking down at a clearing where a massive cobra, decorated in varying shades of brown, lies curled up. Wow, you're right. Shoto looks on. It doesn't blend in at all. Told you. Katori sticks out her tongue. The cobra stirs awake. It rises its body high into the air, showing off its impressive size, and opens its hood. It looks directly at them despite how far they are. It noticed us. Shoto curses under his breath. Yep. Naruto nods. They got a really good sense of smell, so it probably saw us coming a while back. It also sensed we're a threat. Have you also been studying up on snakes? Shoto raises a brow. Kinda. I left a shadow clone back in the leaf to read up on them while we traveled. Naruto laughs. That's cheating, dad. Katori pouts. So. Naruto turns to the cobra looming over the tree lines as it hisses and tries to make itself look even bigger than it already is. It's trying to scare you away. Gonna let it? I'm starting to consider it. Yakamaru squeaks out. Of course not. Katori proclaims. Come on, Yakamaru, let's distract it while Shoto gets close. All right. Yakamaru reluctantly agrees. They both take to the canopies to draw its attention while Shoto goes on the ground. Aviary. Falcons, Katori summons two of the birds by her side. There was a second one but it's not here right now. Let's get this one before backup gets here. Now you tell us. 
Yakamaru protests, but it's a bit too late for that now. Crystal style? Crystal hexagonal shuriken. Yakamaru forms the discs around him and fires them, following Katori's falcons. The cobra hisses and reels back its head. Thrusting forward, streams of clear liquid spurt out from the tips of its fangs. The falcons manage to dodge out of the way, but the crystal shuriken are knocked out of the air. It can shoot venom. Yakamaru cries out. It's a spitting cobra. Katori laughs. That's awesome. Not the time to admire them, Katori. Shoto says as he runs underneath them. Ninja art? Aerial ace. Katori sends out the falcons with their immense speed. They fly by the cobra, lightly cutting its scales with their beaks and claws, but it's little more than an irritation. The cobra begins thrashing and lashing out with its tail to swat at the falcons flying around it. As Katori and Yakamaru enter the clearing, they come in range of its thrashing, with Katori being directly in the way of its tail. Crystal style? Crystal wall. Yakamaru acts immediately to help his friend. Katori takes the additional footing and jumps above the sweeping tail which breaks the wall. Katori uses this moment to inflict some pain. Feather Kunai Barrage. The whole arsenal of feathers materializes next to her, raining down on the cobra as she falls along with them. They embed themselves between its scales with some feathers not managing to hit their mark. It's then that Shoto joins in on the action, flickering to the snake's side. He brings in both fists close to his side, earth spear already active, and thrusts them forward with all his might, twisting as he strikes. Parallel strike. The hit sends waves of pain through the snake's body. It slithers away while using its way to deter its pursuers, although they don't exactly need to stay close to it. Shoto slams his hands on the ground. Earth style? Stone bamboo shoots. Two spikes jut out from the earth in an attempt to stab at its body, but it only slithers past them, unfazed by the moving stone. Before it fully gets away, it flicks its tail one final time, catching Shoto by surprise. He braces himself for impact, the very tip of the tail whipping him across his arms. He's sent flying back from the force of it. Katori flickers over and grabs him, taking him further back. Katori looks back to Yakamaru. Your crystal style's super versatile. Can't you stop it? I don't think so. Yakamaru answers. I still need time to make them hardy enough. Shoto hisses in pain. Couldn't you just turn it to crystals? Be a lot quicker. Yakamaru looks away, hanging his head. I don't know if I can. He walks over with his head lowered and places a hand over Shoto's arms. Mystical palm. Shoto clicks his tongue. We're here to kill them, anyway, remember? Whether it's gonna be you or us, we still have to do it. I know that. But still. That's fine, Yoku. Katori gives him a thumbs up. If you don't feel up for it, we'll handle it. You baby him too much. Shoto readies his stance. It's coming again. Aviary. Ostrich. Katori summons her big hitter. From the treetops overlooking the clearing, Naruto carefully watches on as his kids fight. He keeps a careful eye on them in case they get in over their head, but so far it seems like a fight they can easily handle on their own. Of course, fighting more of them might prove a bit difficult at their current level, so when they go on to kill the remainder, he'll be fighting right there with them to help them conserve energy. Speaking of the remainder, from behind him, he senses a threat approaching at great speeds. Several in fact. He waits until they're close enough to act. As a giant cobra leaps from the ground to swallow him whole, he turns to glare at it with yellow eyes. Oi. His cold voice stops the cobra in its tracks. It slithers back, both it and its companion cowering in fear. I'm trying to watch my students here. He growls. Get lost. Naruto disappears from the trees, appearing in the air right next to them. His neck bulges out, kneading chakra into his tongue. Fighting tongue slash. He lashes out with his elongated tongue, ripping into the snakes at the blink of an eye. The cobra slithers toward the kids, zigzagging in a seemingly random pattern. It spits its venom once again causing them to spread out to avoid. It whips its tail around, this time in a wave-like pattern, making it much more difficult to dodge. Yakamaru is blown back, Shoto manages to jump over it, as do Katori and her ostrich. However, it rears its tail back again, catching Katori off guard. She's slammed against a tree. As she lies by the tree, dizzy, the cobra lunges at her. Katori! Shoto calls to her and rushes to help. Shoto, your arms aren't healed. Yakamaru Chris out. Don't need them. He proclaims. Shoto focuses on his earth spear and transfers the hardened attribute from his arms to his legs. He leaps into the air, right at the lunging cobra. He spins his whole body around, prepared to strike. Back kick. He hits it right in the side of the head, sending it flying back. Katori snaps out of it just in time to see how dangerously close she is. 
When the snake opens its giant maw to try and eat Shoto, she makes a move. Her ostrich runs right into its mouth, stomping on its insides as it does. Once it gets inside, Katori dismisses her jutsu. The ostrich turns into a clump of feathers. Feather kunai barrage. The snake reels in pain as its insides are pierced by the sharp feathers. Yakamaru watches on as his friends take on the cobra with such determination, gripping onto his harness. They're not even remotely hesitating. Meanwhile I'm back here. He bites down on his lip hard enough to draw out blood. Damn it. It's then that he notices another entity approaching from behind the trees. Slightly smaller than the cobra they're currently fighting, but still an impressive size in its own right, a second cobra emerges and spits out venom from its fangs. Katori. Yakamaru calls out a warning, but it comes too late. Katori manages to turn her head around enough to see the venom coming at her, but not soon enough to react. It hits her in the back, seeping through her clothes and sizzling as it touches her skin. She screams in pain as she hits the floor. Crystal style. Divine pathway. In a rage, Yakamaru activates his jutsu without even thinking. A series of crystals jut out from his position, forming in a herringbone pattern, and growing ever larger and larger as they go forward. When they reach the snake, it tries to slither away, but their increasing size trap it in place. Seeing this happen, Shoto acts. Earth style? Stone bamboo shoot. A spike of rock emerges right under the trapped snake's head from between the gaps in Yakamaru's crystals and pierces right into its head. The snake struggles for a bit before going limp. Katori hisses in pain but picks herself up. Can't let you guys have all the fun. Don't push yourself. Shoto warns her. I'm fine. She says, shaking hands betraying her words. She goes through her signature hand signs. Aviary. Hotsun, the colorful bird materializes in front of her with its darker top, orange underbelly, and wild comb of hair. I don't think the stinky bird is going to help you. Katori grins. Just watch. This is a trick Shizune taught me. The Hotsun flies toward the cobra to put itself in a better position. When it gets close enough, it flaps its wings, the air around it refracting from the very stench that covers its body. You better cover your nose. Katori warns. Ninja art? Poison mist from the Hotsun's body, it emanates a purple cloud of poison and uses its wing flap to direct it at the cobra. The cloud envelops the cobra's entire body, and while it does manage to get out of it, it's already taken in poison in its system. Aviary. Ostrich. Shoto's let's finish it. She declares. Right. He rushes toward it. Both Shoto and the ostrich jump high into the air, ready to come crashing down with their full might. Ninja art. Crushing impact, healed rock. The force from both jutsu sends the snake crashing into the ground, unmoving. With the dust clearing and both cobras lying dormant, Yakamaru immediately runs to Katori to check up on her burned back. Are you all right? He worries over her. Mystical palm. Yeah, I'm fine. She winces but bears a grin. Shoto walks over and crosses his arms. That wouldn't have happened if you'd acted earlier. Yakamaru lowers his head. I'm sorry. Hey, don't yell at him. Katori puffs out her cheeks. You did good, Yoku. She looks back to him with a smile. At this point Naruto walks down into the clearing with them. What happened? Sensei. Yakamaru looks back with worry as he heals Katori's injuries. I'm. I'm sorry. It's all right, dad. I wasn't being careful. She keeps up her smile despite the pain. Yakamaru lowers his head again. Shoto's right. If I wasn't so. Naruto kneels by Katori to inspect her wounds and places a hand on Yakamaru's head. I see. You all did your best, right? That's good. Yeah. Yakamaru nods meekly. I didn't, though. Not really. How's it looking, Doc? Katori tries to keep the mood lighter. I think I can heal it with what I have. Yakamaru releases the mystical palm and takes off one of the scrolls attached to his harness. He unrolls it on the ground behind Katori, revealing the complex jutsu formulae written on it. He places his arms on the scroll, and they all watch as the writing moves and spreads out of the scroll and covers Katori's back. Naruto whistles, clearly impressed. Didn't know you could do that. It's for more serious injuries. Sakura-sensei said it was recently devised as a portable healing station. It's nowhere near as strong as what they have in hospitals, though. You're pretty awesome, Yoku. So what do we do now, Shisho? Shoto asks. We wait for Yakamaru to heal Katori, and then your arms, and we move to find the rest of them. I expect you guys to take down the rest of them even faster. Yes, Shisho. Naruto pats Katori on the head, both giving each other a silent assurance, and sits to act as lookout while the kids rest up. Hidden Leaf Village As Team 9 returns from their very first Seer Ank mission, 
Pleased with their work, they of course make their way to the mission's assignment offices to hand in their report and sign off on a job well done. As they approach the building, they actually see Team 5 coming from the opposite direction, about as exhausted as them from all the running around. Yo, Naruto waves to them. You guys just get back, too. Shino nods. Indeed. We've accomplished our missions successfully and come to report it. I presume the same goes for you. You bet. Naruto gives a thumbs up. As the two teams stop by the main gate to have a chat, Katori keeps eyeing the front door of the building. Kashiwama follows her gaze. She slides a step toward the door and he does the same. She begins power walking to the door with him right by her side. As Katori speeds up her step as they approach the building, so does Kashiwama. Kashiwama speeds up his step, so does Katori. In the end, they both end up running at top speed parallel to each other. Aren't those too tired? Shoto groans as she rubs his sore shoulder. What's even the rush? Genzai looks on as their forms hide behind the front doors. We only just got back. Oh, Naruto laughs, Katori decided to make this a race as to which team finished their first C-rank mission first. So she and Kashiwama made a bet all on their own? Jiriki asks. Naruto scratches his chin. No, I don't think Kashiwama knew. Then what's he running for? Genzai sighs. Must be some kind of idiot telepathy. Jiriki admires their stupidity. It seems like Katori and Kashiwama entered the room at the same time, causing a ruckus that ended up with them being reprimanded as their teams entered the room, long after they did. In the end, neither team actually finished their mission first, as Naruto and Shino handed their reports together. With that out of the way, the kids run out in a rush, excited to share their stories about how their C-rank missions went. As always, their place for meeting and talking is Ramen Ichiraku where Yakamaru's mom is currently on shift. The sensei, meanwhile, have a chat of their own up on a rooftop, away from the kids. Naruto catches Shino up on how the kids did, and Shino does the same. So, Naruto leans against a railing, how many stragglers did you miss? Please, Naruto, I wouldn't allow any such stragglers to exist. Shino states. My Kikachu were thorough in their hunt. Naruto raises a brow. So how come you agreed to stay if you got them all? I suppose I needed a reminder that our duties extend beyond our missions. Our duties as people, as opposed to shinobi. So you just wanted to help them as much as Kashiwama, huh? Precisely. Shino turns to look at Naruto, although his glasses make it difficult as always to gauge his expression. He reminds me a lot of you, in a way. Willing and eager to help those who need it. It's where he thrives, in fact. Yeah, he's a good kid. Naruto smiles. I feel like you just complimented yourself by extension. Shino says. Naruto laughs and pats him on the back. Come on, let's go treat our kids. He hops off the rooftop. Shino chuckles lightly and follows him down. End of chapter 66